Welcome to Hub History, the show that brings you fascinating stories from Boston history. This is episode 13, Catherine Nanny Naylor, Boston's 17th century nasty woman. Hi, I'm Jake, and this week we're going to do things a little bit differently. We usually record on Friday or Saturday, and this Saturday I just returned from the Boston Women's March. Co-host Nikki is away this weekend in New York to join the Women's March there, so it only seems appropriate that we're going to take a look at the life of a woman named Catherine Nanny Naylor, who lived and died in Boston in its earliest days. When we think about women in the 17th century, we usually conjure a picture of someone who's utterly powerless in her society. Someone who only exists as a reflection of the father or the husband in her life, unable to own property or to control her own destiny in any way. But Catherine was different. She was a strong, independent woman in a society that didn't think such a thing should exist. How did she get that way? And how do we know so much about her life? We'll learn all that and more. But first, it's time to take a look at what's coming up this week in Boston history. Monday is January 23rd, and that marks the anniversary of the crash of World Airways Flight 30 at Logan Airport. Flight 30 was a DC-10 coming on the short hop from Newark with about 200 passengers and 12 crew aboard. In the reduced visibility of a foggy, rainy night, the pilots touched down too far down the runway. Normally, this would have been a harmless error, but the runway was covered in ice and the plane was unable to break and didn't have enough runway to take off again. The plane skidded off the end of the runway and into Boston Harbor, breaking into two pieces just behind the nose. Passengers donned their life vests and evacuated into the life rafts and into the harbor itself. It was initially reported that all passengers had been successfully rescued, but a few days later officials realized that a father and son who had transferred from another flight at the last minute didn't appear on the passenger manifest. Walter and Leo Metcalf were presumably killed in the crash, but their bodies were never recovered. On January 24, 1933, Boston mob boss Charles King Solomon was murdered by rivals at the Cotton Club in the South End. Solomon was the son of Russian Jewish immigrants, and his Jewish gang had been locked in a power struggle with the Irish and Italian mobs for control of the lucrative bootleg liquor trade during the days of Prohibition. The head of the Irish mob had already been assassinated, so this murder left the Italians firmly in charge of organized crime in Boston. We'll have a picture of Solomon in this week's show notes. Wednesday is an important anniversary in our city's revolutionary history. On January 25, 1776, Henry Knox arrived in Boston with his noble train of artillery. Knox had been a bookseller in Boston and was self-educated in the science of artillery. After Benedict Arnold seized Fort Ticonderoga in upstate New York from the British, George Washington dispatched Knox there in November 1775 to see if there was ordnance that could be used to drive the British out of Boston. After taking command, General Washington quickly saw that he needed cannon to drive the British from Boston. Washington soon heard of one man who was an expert on cannon, the bookseller Henry Knox, who had studied books on artillery in his small shop. Washington made Knox his colonel of artillery. And in December 1775, Knox set out across the snow to bring cannon from Fort Ticonderoga, far to the west. Mighty and forbidding, the stone fort frowned out over the frozen waters of Lake Champlain. Knox selected 59 cannon and roped them to huge sleds. Then he gathered oxen and men, a hardy band in coon caps and deerskin leggings. January 1776, the mighty caravan lurched forth. It looked like an impossible task for the former bookseller to drag the huge guns 300 miles through wilderness in the dead of winter. Until finally, late one night, they arrived outside Boston, a ragged and bony crew. Knox rode straight to General Washington. At your service, General, with 59 cannon. Well done, Henry. I think, General, they will allow you to blow those British right out of Boston. That clip, of course, is from the Fisher-Price Spellbinder tape, American Revolution. I've mentioned it before as teaching me more about the history of the Revolution than any class I ever took. But do you know what I just noticed? 
The entire tape is 47 minutes and 48 seconds long, but the events in Boston take up the first 44 minutes and 45 seconds. That doesn't leave a whole lot of time for the entire rest of the war. No wonder I ended up as a Boston history buff. We'll have a link to a bootleg of that tape in the show notes for this week's episode at hubhistory.com slash 013. Thursday is January 26th, which marks a landmark Civil War anniversary. The Massachusetts governor in 1863 was John Albion Andrew, a radical abolitionist. As the war dragged on, he pushed hard to recruit African Americans in the fight for freedom, but he was blocked by the Militia Acts of 1792 that restricted service to free white men. This, of course, despite the fact that African Americans had served gallantly in the Patriot cause in the recent revolution. Finally, on January 26, 1863, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton issued an order expressly allowing Andrew to begin recruiting, quote, infantry for the volunteer military service and may include persons of African descent organized into separate corps. The most famous of these separate corps was the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment. The African-American soldiers of the 54th and their white officers trained in my neighborhood, Reedville, then, in July of 1863, they assaulted Fort Wagner in South Carolina. They were decimated. Their bravery is remembered with a memorial across from the State House on Beacon Hill and in the 1989 movie Glory. Stay tuned for a future episode on the Massachusetts 54th, and we'll have a link to Secretary Stanton's order in the show notes for this week's episode at hubhistory.com slash 013. On January 27, 1690, Boston saw a last-minute reprieve. An accused pirate named Thomas Hawkins had been convicted and sentenced to death, and he had, in fact, mounted the gallows with the noose placed around his neck. Just before he was to be turned off, as they called it back then, a reprieve arrived, sparing his life. Hawkins' sisters, Elizabeth, Sarah, Hannah, and Abigail, were all married to leading figures in Massachusetts Bay Colony, including, in Abigail's case, a Winthrop, and in Hannah's case, one of Thomas's judges. You have to imagine that must have helped. However, Thomas Hawkins' happy ending didn't last very long. He was banished from Massachusetts Bay, and while his ship was en route to England that March, it was attacked by French privateers, and he was killed in the battle. Boston Light, America's first light station, was designated a National Historic Landmark on January 28, 1964. The original beacon was built in 1716, then during the American Revolution it was burned twice by Patriots and blown up by the retreating British in 1776. The tower was rebuilt in 1783. Today it's the last manned light station in the Coast Guard service, though it has in fact been womaned since 2003 by Sally Snowman the 70th keeper of Boston Light. Though it remains an active light station and an important navigation aid, it also serves as a tourist destination and a historic site in keeping with its landmark status. And finally, Sunday is January 29th. On January 29th, 1970, there was a riot at Northeastern University. The university had invited the controversial president of San Francisco State College, S.I. Hayakawa, to debate a panel of fellow college presidents. However, no other college presidents were willing to share a stage with Hayakawa, who had become a conservative darling and quite a controversial figure after cracking down on protesters at his school. Instead, he gave a speech to a ticketed audience, and while he was speaking, some 2,000 protesters organized by Students for a Democratic Society and the Weathermen gathered on the quad. Boston police massed on the stairs of the L building, over the course of the next two and a half hours or so, the two sides clashed violently, with many injured on both sides. The sources I've seen are very muddled by the politics of that era, so I'm not going to try to assign any responsibility. However, curious listeners can review a collection of clippings that are preserved in the Northeastern Class of 1972 yearbook, and we'll post a link to that in this week's show notes, so you can make up your own mind. Well, with that note of protest in mind we'll tip our hats to the Women's March by talking about a strong, independent woman in the earliest era of our city. Our story begins in 1636, just six years after Boston was founded, in the midst of a period known as the Great Migration. 
Starting with the Winthrop fleet in 1630, the next decade brought about 20,000 Puritan immigrants from England to the shores of North America. One of these new immigrants was a young girl named Catherine Wheelwright, the daughter of a Puritan minister named John Wheelwright. Wheelwright brought his family to Boston in May of 1636, during the peak of the migration period. It was also the peak of the antinomian controversy, in which Anne Hutchinson and her followers clashed with the church hierarchy over the role of faith and works in obtaining salvation. John Wheelwright was Hutchinson's brother-in-law, and he was soon preaching a theology that lay more in line with hers than that of the established church. By March of 1637, he was on trial, and in November of that year, he was sentenced to banishment. Since he had young children, the court was willing to let him wait until the following spring to depart the colony if he would just agree to shut up until then. Of course, he refused to stop preaching and was ejected into the New England winter, making his way north to New Hampshire. The family, including little Catherine, followed in the spring of 1638. Catherine's early life was hard as the family moved across the New Hampshire and Maine frontiers from settlement to settlement, staying out of reach of the Puritan authorities. By the time Catherine was about 14, Massachusetts Bay Colony was willing to forgive and forget, but her father was not. He remained on the frontier until he finally returned to England in 1655. After the family had moved to what's now Exeter, New Hampshire in 1646, Catherine met a wealthy merchant named Robert Nanny. They married sometime before 1653 and moved to Boston's North End. Nanny traded in lumber and salt cod, and he administered an estate he held in the Caribbean. The couple had their first child in 1653, and they would go on to have a total of eight children. Unfortunately, only two of them would live to adulthood. As was more or less customary at the time, Robert Nanny's will specified that his property should be held in trust for his children, with Catherine as trustee. And, unfortunately for the family, he did die in 1663, when he was 50 and Catherine was about 33 years old. Women at that time were not considered full and autonomous citizens, so as was customary, Catherine remarried fairly quickly. Sometime before 1666, she had married a North End neighbor and fellow merchant named Edward Naylor. Unfortunately, Edward turned out to be, well, a bit of a bastard. Soon after their second child was born, his behavior became outrageous. He was physically abusive to Catherine and to the children. In later testimony, servants said that he would throw food, plates, and even chairs at Catherine and the kids. He repeatedly pushed one of his small children to the ground, and he kicked the other one down a flight of stairs. The abuse was bad enough, but his infidelity seems to have been the straw that broke the camel's back. Edward made advances on servants and on other women he came in contact with, whether the attention was welcome or not. An 18-year-old household servant said that he had come home drunk one night and tried to kiss and grope her, but she ran, later testifying, I suppose he was so drunk he could not follow me. Eventually, he found a lover who would take him. His affair with another servant named Mary Reed was revealed while they were recognized traveling together in New Hampshire and looking for a place for Mary to give birth to their love child. Catherine would later recall how she felt ill after being served beer by Mary Reed. Neighbors had seen Mary trying to buy henbane in the market, a notorious poison, so she was also accused of trying to kill Catherine. And, as a personal note, you can throw a chair at me if you want, but hands off my beer. Finally, Catherine had enough. In 1671, she petitioned the Superior Court for release against the cruelty and oppression and many abuses she frequently, indeed daily, receives from her husband, besides his whoredoms and abuses of the marriage bed. I'm not certain that it was the first in Massachusetts, but it is the earliest divorce I've seen here. And while divorce seems surprising for a theocracy like Puritan Massachusetts Bay Colony, they viewed marriage as a civil contract, and in cases of abuse or adultery, there was a provision for divorce. And Catherine's case certainly qualified. Edward and Mary decamped to Maine while the divorce proceedings were in process, went into the fur trade, and sank into obscurity. In the years that followed, Catherine's eldest children died, 
and the property that had been held in trust for them reverted to Catherine's name. Take that, patriarchy! In the words of one historian, Catherine Naylor's identity shifted dramatically between 1668 and 1674. She went from being the wife of Edward Naylor to a woman who belonged to no one but her children. At some point she realized that her interests no longer lay with her husband, and that her identity could no longer lie there either. However, she did still have the two younger children who Edward had fathered, and she needed to find a way to take care of them. Our story up to this point has been supported by the documentary record of Catherine and Edward's divorce. From the time of their divorce until Catherine's last will and testament, there's little documentary evidence of life in the nanny household. I say nanny because Catherine went back to using her first husband's name after the divorce, Catherine Nanny. However, there is plenty of evidence of their lives. In 1992, during the Big Dig, archaeologists digging in a parking lot under the elevated Southeast Expressway found the remains of a privy, an outhouse that is, that they linked to Catherine Nanny's household. And the contents of that privy reveal quite a bit about Catherine's life. First of all, there were remains of silk and lace garments that indicate that she was doing pretty well for herself. How was she providing an upper-middle-class lifestyle to her family? Well, the privy was a three-holer, so she had a pretty large home, leading to speculation that she was operating a boarding house. There was also an unnaturally large number of cherry pits, perhaps indicating that she was baking, or maybe even that she was making some illegal hooch. The trust she had inherited from her first husband also included a wharf and property holdings in Maine, both of which she was operating. Between her domestic entrepreneurship and her business holdings, she was apparently doing okay for herself, which meant that she could indulge in a forbidden pastime. The most famous artifact found in this famous privy was a small wooden sphere with a dimple in one side. It's the remains of the oldest known bowling ball in North America. Not the bowling game we know today with a wooden lane and gutters and pins. It was a lawn bowling game more similar to today's bocce. The dimple would have held a lead weight with an ivory covering, and a player would bowl that weighted ball after another ball in the grass. This is revealing because bowling was illegal in Boston for most of Catherine's adult life. Puritan Boston prohibited bowling for the same reason it prohibited cards. Any pastime that could tempt a person to gamble could not be allowed. So for Catherine to be in possession of a bowling ball, she must have also had a walled yard to allow for some privacy. Again, a woman of some means. Regulations against bowling started to be loosened in the early 1700s, but by then Catherine had retired. She was no longer able to operate her house, and her daughters were married and lived far away. In 1700, she moved in with friends in Charlestown, and she lived with them for the rest of her life. Catherine Nanny, alias Naylor, passed away in 1716. She was a woman in an era that insisted that women only existed as the reflection of the men in their lives. But thanks to the documentary evidence of her divorce and the rich archaeology of her privy, we have the record of a strong, independent woman and that seems just perfect for an episode I'm recording in the evening after the Boston Women's March. If you want to learn more about Catherine Nanny Naylor and other strong Boston women, check out the show notes for this week's episode at hubhistory.com 013. We'll have a link to a book called Wild Women of Boston, Metal and Moxie in the Hub. We'll also have photos of the famous privy from the City Archaeology Department, photos of many of the artifacts found there from the state's archaeologists, and an image of Catherine's signed divorce petition. Speaking of the show notes, we got a new listener with episode 11, our show on the Ursuline Convent riots. Brendan Kearney wrote in saying, Great episode. The riots were one reason Holy Cross was founded in Worcester in 1843. See Thy Honored Name, A History of the College of the Holy Cross, 1843 to 1994. Another book on the riots is Fire and Roses, which is in the syllabus for the Irish American Experience course at the Holy Cross. I'll have to go back now and listen to the other episodes. Thanks for making them. No, thank you, Brendan. We'll link to the books that Brendan recommended in the show notes for this week's episode. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at podcast at hubhistory.com or go to hubhistory.com and click on the Contact Us link.
We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash hubhistory and on Twitter as at hubhistory. We'll be back next week with our first episode celebrating Black History Month. <laughs>